We continue to preview the 2024 college volleyball season. Our stop today is Fremont, Nebraska, as we get to visit with Paul Gieselman, who is the head volleyball coach for the Midland Warriors. Coach, it's a privilege to get to visit with you again. I was looking back, and it, it's been four years since you've stopped by the summit, and I'm very thankful for your time today. I appreciate that. I'd like to talk a little bit about last year, uh, an appearance in the NAIA quarterfinals. You made the trip deep into the playoffs, and that was after a year where the record looked like maybe that wasn't going to happen. I mean, give or take on that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. 18 and 12, 10 and 6 in the incredibly tough GPAC Volleyball League. Talk a little bit about last year. Yeah, you know, Joey, one of the things that I've always been a believer in is trying to schedule one of the best, you know, non-conference schedules in the nation. Because in the GPAC, it's the number one volleyball conference in NAIA Volleyball. So you're going to get tested every week in the GPAC. Not everybody believes, you know, in scheduling the toughest schedule in non-conference. I just happen to, I, I don't get concerned about my one loss record in August and September. We're all about preparation for um, November and December. And last year, you know, as you said, Joey, I mean, it was a struggle early on. And we knew it was going to be a little bit of a struggle early on because of who we graduated. You know, we graduated Talia Flores, who was a, a two-time All-American outside hitter for us, great ball control player. And then even more importantly, you know, we lost the national setter of the year and one of the best players to ever put on a Midland uniform in Hope Leinbach. You know, so when you lose those caliber of players, you're, you don't just replace them. So we knew it was going to be a struggle, but the first part of the year, it, it really was about trying to figure out the puzzle. And, you know, we struggled early on in, in almost every area of the game. But the great thing was I've been doing this a long time and our culture here at Midland, you know, it, we, we talk nonstop about, hey, it's not about August and September. It's about November and December. So we, our players don't get caught up early on in those losses. You know, it's about – what are we learning from those losses? And I give our players so much credit last year for just staying the course, believing in what we were doing. And then, you know, we were a completely different team by the time November rolled around. And you saw that when, you know, we we played a great Concordia team twice during the regular season. And and the first time they they took us out behind the woodshed at their place. The second time we were better, you could see we were starting to make some progress, but they still they still beat us. But then when we met them, um, you know, in the national championship tournament in Sioux City for the chance to go to the Elite Eight, we were a whole different team because we'd made a lot of adjustments. Players got better at their positions and we ended up sweeping them. And, and that was really the story of our season. That was a, and it was a, a great way. It wasn't the the finish. I mean, you had another match uh, to go there in the quarterfinals, but it got you out of pool play into that final eight. And uh, yeah, that that was a it was a big time match and and a big time way to play at the end of the season. Coach, you're heading into year number fifteen as the head coach there at Midland, and you mentioned the word culture. I would like to ask you about that too because, you know, it it obviously it plays a big part in it. And and I. As you address, you know, it's not just how, what you do in August and September. It's what you do in November. Your run to the national runner-up was in a, a COVID-shortened year, and you had only 16 wins <laughs> that year, and still they made it there to the end. So talk a little bit about what, what you push with culture and, and what it means. Yeah, it, it, it's a great question, Joey. Um, you know, for us, it all starts with the recruiting process. You know, it's who you bring in. And we're, you know, we're a little bit particular about who we're going to ask to join our family. They got to be high character young women. Um, they got to be academically focused. And obviously, we're looking for great athletes. We're not necessarily looking at the, the volleyball player that's played club since they were eight years old and are completely put together. Um, because a lot of times, we're not going to get that young lady and stuff. So I'm looking for that, that athlete, the multi-sport athlete uh, that just simply can come in and we can teach her how to play the game at the collegiate level. And then the other side of that is, you know, going back to the culture is I'm just big on servant leadership. And we have a, 
you know, we have a culture here that's that's been this way for years now where our juniors and seniors are just tremendous role models for the incoming freshmen and the sophomores yet, you know, to teach them, you know, how to be a student athlete at the collegiate level and how to prioritize their time, but more importantly, how to serve their teammates, not getting caught up in, am I starting? You know, why am I not getting set enough? Those types of things. There's just very little of that that we ever have to worry about in this program. Now, don't get me wrong. We've got competitors. You know, they all want to compete for a starting spot and stuff. But in the end of the day, you know, when it comes time to put the lineup on the floor, our players are really good about accepting their role. And they understand, too, that in August, that starting lineup is not probably going to be the same starting lineup that we have you know, when we get to Sioux City for the national championships. As a matter of fact, the 15 years, 14 years that I've already been here, we've never had the same lineup in November that we've had in August. You know, so that's something that our players understand. We tell them, keep working every day. When your opportunity shows up, you know, be prepared to take advantage of it. But serving your teammates and serving other people, I think is just the the backbone of what we're about. And just one little example, Joey, of this, that seems like a, a really little thing, but I think it speaks volumes about our, our players and, and how they role model then. Our locker room, it, you know, it, a lot of times in the locker room, you have your janitorial staff cleans the locker room and stuff like that. We have our players clean their locker room. It's their home. We want them to understand that. We want them to take care of it. But in a lot of sports, in a lot of programs at the high school level, at the collegiate level, well, what class gets everything dumped on them? The freshmen. Mm -hmm. well, those freshmen become sophomores. And they remember how they had everything dumped on them. So what, they, what do they do? They turn right around and do the same thing to the next freshman class. That's not a servant leadership culture. Our seniors are the ones that do the cleaning. Mm -hmm. And then the freshmen, they see the seniors are there to serve them. There's no task, you know, that our seniors are, are not willing to do to serve the freshmen. And I think that just creates the mindset in our in our program that, hey, we're here for each other. I like it, Coach. I, I really do. I, I've always appreciated the concept of servant leadership. And it's interesting to see how it manifests in, in different, uh, not only cultures, programs where you see – Obviously, the results show on the court and the wins and losses, too. They really do show up there. Well, as we look ahead to 2024 then now, you mentioned Hope Leinbach, and, and uh, I, I don't know how many more of these these uh, years will we'll go. We're going to mention her again somewhere down the line. <laughs> an impact on your program and I think the entirety of, of NAI volleyball. But without her there, you moved to a 6-2 last year and a couple of players setting for you. Among those coming back is Brenna Mackling. Talk a little bit about your setters as we preview 24. Yeah, we're we're most likely going to run a 6-2 again just because the NAI rules with unlimited substitutions, you know, really makes it advantageous for us to do that. Um, but Brenna, you know, as a freshman last year, she really grew into her role. And I think, you know, when you look at, again, us playing our best volleyball at the end of the year, well, Part of that was simply Brenna, you know, really learning and developing what is involved as a collegiate setter, because it's just a different animal than what you are used to in club and high school, you know, type of thing. You have to be that coach on the floor, understanding how to get your best hitters matched up against the opponent's weakest blockers in each rotation, you know, that type of stuff. And you really got to be, even as a freshman, you know, you, you're not the captain out there on the floor, but you've got to be, you know, the, the floor general in the respect you're running the offense. And I think I think the confidence that Brenna gained last year and the way she improved all the way through to the national championships, she had a great offseason. I, I really am expecting big things out of her. And a lot of it, she always had good hands and stuff, Joey, but the mental part of her game now is just so much better. And the other part is defensively, 
a lot of people don't think of setters from a defensive standpoint, but it's really important at the college level because you face so many teams that have great right side hitters, you know, hitting cross court. Your setters got to be able to play defense. And Brenna was was an average defensive player when she came in. She's developed now into a very good defensive player. So that's a big part of it. And then we've got two freshmen coming in uh, that are going to compete, um, you know, for that for that second setter position if we go with the 6-2, which, you know, we most likely will. Um, and I, I think both of them are, are good players. Reagan Bessler from Crete, Nebraska, um, you know, She's she's just a good athlete. Again, incoming freshman though, uh, and then the other young lady that's going to compete is Stella Kuhl from uh, Sioux City North, and she's an exceptional athlete, very quick, and and both of them had the same deal. They're going to be starting out where Brenna was starting out last year, so we've just got to get them up to speed on how to run the offense. Um, but the nice thing is they'll have competition every day in practice, and we'll see who's, you know, in the starting lineup uh, when we roll into Indiana Wesleyan. And I do want to talk about that schedule. We mentioned it or alluded to it a couple of times. It's not going to be an easy schedule when things get started. We'll talk about that in just a moment. As we visit now with Paul Gieselman here on Midwest Sports Net, and I encourage you, please subscribe to the channel. We enjoy talking about small college sports throughout the Midwest and beyond. Uh, Coach, uh, you, you mentioned the offense. A big part of your offensive production last year was Abby, Abby Ringler as uh, she was able to do a number of things for you. Talk a little bit about her and where you're, uh, you're going to get some more of that offensive production this year. Yeah, Abby, you know, six-foot starting middle for us and, again, a great athlete. She touches 10-1, um, and her physical presence at the net, both offensively and blocking, uh, is exceptional. And there, there's a reason she was an All-American last year. So we're really excited about her coming back and, and really being a force at the net for us. The other uh, person that I think we really got to talk about too is uh, Jackie Apel. Jackie yeah. was our starting right side last year, but we're moving her to the middle this year. And she is very similar to Abby Ringler, just an exceptional athlete, very quick, big arm. And, you know, honestly, Joey, there are going to be very few teams uh, in the country that have a better pair of middles than what we have. So we're going to, you know, we're going to hopefully be able to, um, you know, be middle dominant this year because of their athleticism uh, and stuff. And and the nice thing is, I think I think our strengths are going to actually be one of the best defensive teams slash ball control teams in the country. You know, we've got Delaney Belinch coming back as our starting libero, four-year starter now, um, who is really, really good. She had a great year last year. And then we have uh, Kaylin Scott, who was a DS for us last year. She's a captain for us this year. And again, we'll be in the back row. You know, those two – are going to be really, really good again with our ball control. And if we've got great ball control, we're going to be able to get the ball to, you know, our two middles. And that will open up things on the pins. We're not going to have, you know, most likely the same caliber of outside hitters that, say, a Northwestern Iowa has, um, you know, or Indiana Wesleyan or Corbin, um, you know, Viterbo great outside hitters last year that led them to the final four. So we're going to, we're going to be a little bit different team than, than those teams. We're going to have to be middle oriented, but we've got to, we got to do two things. We got to be one of the best defensive teams in the country that starts actually with serving. And we feel like we're going to have six rotations of exceptional serving. And it's kind of been a hallmark of our program. Honestly, Joey, we've always been a great ball control and serving team. This year, we feel like we've got that same ability. The question is, you know, can we maximize our strengths and can we minimize our weaknesses? And, you know, we, we think we've got the opportunity to do that. We're certainly going to find out early with our schedule. Well, Coach, you went ahead and previewed the defense a little bit for me and talking about Delaney and Morris. So let's get to that schedule. August 6th, 15th and 16th, actually, it's a Thursday and Friday there as you all head to Marion, Indiana. 
among the teams you're going to be facing, the defending national champions in Indiana Wesleyan. You mentioned them a little bit earlier. The next weekend uh, could be a little even tougher than that in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and the, the three teams on the slate for you, Viterbo, you mentioned them, as well as Corbin, you mentioned them too, and um, Missouri Baptist. Uh, in that weekend. So you get an opportunity to get things started. It's not till September 4th. You go to College of St. Mary, the GPAC schedule gets underway. But I think for fans who really enjoy volleyball, watching Midland through the month of August should be fun. Yeah. And, you know, we we do that for a couple of reasons. You know, I joke sometimes, um, you know, my wife will ask me, who sets your schedule for goodness sakes? <laughs> and I you know, I say, well, it's somebody not very smart, I think, because I, I, it'd be a lot easier at home early in August and September if I played an easier schedule. You know, I'd be a little happier person as a coach probably for my wife. But the great thing about our schedule is two things. One, I set it up this way, Joey, to test our players. You know, if you come to Midland University to play volleyball, you know you're coming here because you're a competitor and you want to be challenged to be the best student athlete you're capable of being. And to do that, you got to play against the best teams. You know, if you want to be great in November and December, you got to be tested early. And that's something I've always believed in. And as you mentioned, you know, we open up the season with the defending national champs um, out at their place. And not just Indiana Wesleyan, but IU Kokomo is out there. And I think a lot of people – uh, you know, underestimated last year how good IU Kokomo was. I think they went 34-4 and four last year, Joey, and they were a whisker away in the fifth game from knocking off Indiana Wesleyan in, in the last pool play match. Mm -hmm. That's how talented they are, and they return a lot of their players. I expect them to honestly easily be a top-10 team this year. And then we play Grace University as the third team out there, they went 24 and 11. Now you mentioned we go up to Wisconsin at Viterbo University. I I love that tournament. Um, Ryan at at Viterbo, just a great coach. They're good every year. And then Chris, longtime coach at uh, uh, Mobap, mm -hmm. who had just stepped down to a, a more of a volunteer coach this year, I believe. Him and Chris and, and Ryan and I have gotten to be good friends several years ago. We got together and decided, hey, what if we do a tournament with all three of our teams and then we'll add a fourth team? We just rotate it amongst our schools, you know, every year. And it's turned out to be way better than any of us thought it would be because it provides such great competition for our fans, yeah. not to mention, you know, a great test for our teams. And it's just been it's been a wonderful tournament. And, you know, Viterbo, Final Four last year, uh, Missouri Baptist, they've won multiple national championships as a program. I think in the final poll last year, right before the national tournament, they were eighth. Corbin, who's really, really good, they came to that tournament last year when we were the host of it. Um, I had a great conversation with the coach. She wanted to come out, and she enjoyed it so much that, you know, she's going to come back again at Viterbo this year. So, you know, they were number seven last year in that final poll. All of these teams are capable of being top five, top ten for sure. So it's going to be a great test. It should be a lot of fun, and, and we're going to follow that along too, specifically that weekend. It, it, it It's going to be one of those great weekends, I think, all the way around for NAI as, as sports are really getting underway, and that one should be a good one to follow that weekend. And, of course, GPAC schedule following that. Coach Paul Gieselman, thank you very much for taking time with us today here. The Midland Warriors coming off another trip to the NAIA, well, deep into the NAIA playoffs, quarterfinalists last year. And as you head into year 15, success to you all. Success to the Warriors. We'll keep following you along, and thank you for your time. Appreciate it, Joey, very much. Appreciate all you do for promoting NAIA sports, too. <laughs> 